For those of you guys who don't know, this is John Nicewanger. John Nicewanger has been a mentor for me from the very beginning. So, um, so like, though Pierce has told me that I needed to call John. If I was getting into soil health, I needed to call John because he had already been doing it for years. So to me, like John started doing this stuff 10 years ago when it was super uber duper crazy to be doing it. John's trained himself in my CrossFit. How, why can't I ever say that word right? So John can look at his biology underneath the microscope and he can see the fungal spores. He can see fungal hyphae. If it is bad soil, he can see the ciliates. You don't really need a microscope to tell you that. If it smells bad, it's bad. But I, I'm really excited that he is to, here to, to share with you and he is a wealth of knowledge. So if you're local and you want to learn from John, get his number and, and, and pick his brain. He knows far more about all this stuff than I do. And so I'm really excited that he agreed to speak to us and... There's your intro, John. All right. All right. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. When Jay asked me, I, was, I had sworn at the beginning of the year that, or the last time I spoke, that I wasn't going to ever do that again because I really do not enjoy being in front of people. I love one-on-one -on -one and, and, and talking and answering and talking about this stuff. It is one of my favorite things to talk about, and, you know, most people don't want to hear it. So, so I don't really get a lot of conversations about soil health and, and what we're doing on our, our farm unless – unless I go somewhere or do something. Um, but Jay's a good friend, so I said, okay. And, and he's doing something, I, I love what he's doing. He's, he is getting the word out. He, he's fun to listen to and, he, and he's excited about it. And it, it is really fun to see people that are excited about it. And it's fun to listen to people that are excited about soil health and realize, you know, we've got to make some changes um, to see our future, so. All right, with that, I'll give you an introduction. This is uh, my family, a wife and stuff. We're the nice wongers. We're third generation out here in this area, or I am anyways. And um, we want to be able to pass this. We only have one son, so I don't know if we'll get to pass it on to him, but we do want to pass it on to future generations in better shape than we, than we received it. Jay asked me to speak on the six soil principles, which is good i don't have to show you all the stuff that we've been doing i can i've, I've got a, a way to go otherwise my mind goes in a lot of different directions so it was, it was very good that he gave me a, a topic and a direction to go i won't have near this the length and speech that he does so we'll have plenty of times at the end for question and answer um i prefer that way but uh, we'll go over the six soil health principles and kind of what we've done to apply them on our place um so our six soil health principles are, first, and I think this is one of the most important things when you start down this journey, is you need to know your context. Your context is where you live, water, soil, humidity, those different things. But most importantly, you need to know your context. Second one is, and I, I believe in our area with our winds, with our low humidity, we have to cover the soil, um, keep the wind off, keep it in place, you know, aggregation, all that stuff is good, but the most effective and quickest way to protect that soil is to get something on top of it and try and keep it there, which takes us to minimize soil disturbance. That is how we keep the soil covered. One of the ways is by not disturbing it, mixing it, tilling it, all that. Now, um, I did struggle to find slides for minimize soil disturbance because that's what it is. Just don't till. And so it's a, it's a pretty simple concept, but it, it is much harder to do out here than you think because our weeds are very adaptive. Um, increasing diversity. This is one of my favorite uh, principles. Um, we love, I like trying new things. Uh, many of them don't work, but occasionally we get one that does, and that's that's how we learn. But uh, increasing diversity, we want to increase it in our plants. We want to decrease it in our animals. And, um, you know, we want to see the wildlife start to come back. We want to see the soil microbes, the soil macro organisms that we can actually see as indicators. We want to see those start to come back. Um, and we do that by having a lot of different roots in the ground, having different plants for the animals above ground to consume, 
you know, and um, and different animals out there grazing. Fifth, we want to maintain continuous living plant roots. And I will tell you in this area, that is one of the concepts we have struggled to call successful. We've tried it. We've done different ways at it. The rotation is probably the hardest key for me to crack out here is that constant root in the soil without going to perennials and um, perennials and cattle work great. It's kind of hard to cash flow on cropland, especially with $6 corn and $10 wheat. Um, but um, it is key to keeping that aggregation going and the biology alive is, <coughs> is to have a living root in the soil at all times. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through it. And the sixth one is then to integrate the livestock. And I believe the livestock is what really cranks the system and starts it going. I kind of did these backwards, I will admit. First thing I saw was cover crops. I was like, great, but I got to get cash flow from my cover crops. So we brought the animals on immediately. Animals can build soil and they can destroy soil. So um, they're very important to the system, but they can destroy it way faster than about anything else you can do to the system besides tillage. And they, they do a fair amount of tillage in their own. So... Um, those are our six principles. We'll start with the first one, know our context. Here's where we're, related, uh, where we're located at. Um, we're kind of between Sharon Springs, Tribune, Leota. We actually live in Logan County, so Oakley is our county seat, but we're 60 miles from our county seat. So <laughs> we call these other towns kind of home too. Um, but we're kind of right out here in the middle. Our annual rainfall is somewhere, it says 18.4. I look back through the records. These must not be 30-year records. I'm guessing they're only using like five-year averages because they seem to move a half inch a year. So our averages must not be long, but we call ourselves 16 to 18 inches. Um, looks like this, this was pulled from Tribune uh, weather station here. Um, and here's kind of where we're at for this year. Um, we're at 14.76, and I don't recall any events in November, and we haven't had anything to December to account for moisture. Somehow the experiment station will always come up with a few hundreds and tenths here and there, which I have no idea where they come up with. <laughs> but <clears throat> this July, we did not get that event. I have no idea how they got a seven on there. But uh, there must have been a single rain event, and it seems like there was one that was a three or four inch. Lake Drew. Yeah. So there must have been a very large rain event. Hopefully they put it all in their soil. I would bet most of them didn't, but they probably got a half of it maybe. Um, but anyways, you pull that number back to where the average is, which is three, which is probably closer to where we were on our place. And you'd see we're, we're behind average, behind normal. So you need to take this into context, not only as our averages and putting your five-year plan together, but your next year plan needs to kind of, don't ignore the data, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, uh, they're getting much, much better at our weather forecasting as far as three months out. They aren't always right because there's always exceptions, but they tend to be, that trend tends to be what they forecast. And right now, you know, ocean temperatures and everything, they're still calling for three more months of below average moisture. So remember that when you are thinking about putting something in that uh, our plant populations need to be a little less or, you know, just be aware of where you're at, I guess is what I'm saying. The other factor we want to take into for our context is kind of where are we at on this brittleness scale? I, I have my own opinions. Based on what I've read, I would say we're somewhere in that six, seven range. Some years it feels like an eight or nine. Other years we're probably closer to five. But the brittleness scale is based not just on rainfall, but also on humidity and the rate, the humidity, the length or the level of the way the humidity fluctuates versus, you know, what are you always around that 50, 60 or around that 80 percent or in our area, we're kind of what we would consider more arid, where 
You know, in the summertime, we'll see single digits in our humidity. Um, and then sometimes in the evenings, we will see as high as 60, 70, 80 percent. I remember back when we were doing hay back early 2000s, I would go almost a whole, we'd put alfalfa down. I'd get out there, I'd get about eight hours of good hay production. And then it would come in dry. We'd be too dry to put anything up. And it would be three or four days before we got a humidity event over 50%. So <clears throat> that greatly, I think, affects the, that, top, that top inch, that top. That's why it is so important to have cover on top of that soil. This is what happens when we have these 100 mile an hour winds that we had last year in December. Um, it will strip all of that stuff off the top. So we have to remember that we have wind events that will remove residue. And I believe this affects us in our planting, which we'll, I'll discuss a little later. But when we, when we take a corn crop off and we're looking to put something else in the ground, we need to think about, is the moisture there to bring that up? Is there moisture coming to bring that up? And remember that we'll have three to four, sometimes five events of excess of 50 mile an hour. And sometimes those events will last more than a day, sometimes two to three days. Those are really miserable events when they happen that long. We've, we've had two already this year that have lasted for a day at least. Um, and and it, what you will see is if you go out there with a drill or anything, when that residue is dried down to where it's so dry, it just it's, it's just very brittle and breaks apart. And when one of those wind events, I mean, it'll look fine when you drill it, but one of those wind events come, all of that uh, leaf material and everything is in the ditch and the neighbor's field or the pastures. It is not on the field. So we've got to keep this. This is one of the greatest factors I use in, in deciding how we're going to, what we're going to do next is where are we at on this? What is going to come the next week, next few days, next month. So just keep this in mind. Um, everybody understand the brittleness scale? I guess I should ask that. That it's not just rainfall. It has to do with your fluctuation too. Like, um, I guess they also describe it as if your rainfall comes for one or two months and then shuts off for three or four months. If you have real seasonality between rain events, that also will put you lower on the, or higher on this scale. Next is cover the soil. We want a good cover, complete cover across that soil. And there's a lot of ways to get that, but we've gone back and forth, whether we want that upright out here, you know, we've seen information come from the experiment stations that stripper straw, you know, yields better than cut shorter straw. And, and I believe that has a lot to do with our wind. But, you know, when I start thinking about microbes and stuff, um, we want, we've noticed that when we put a thatch layer down connecting with that soil, it gives those microbes food. It also seems to lock that moisture in when you pull that thatch layer. It is wet below that. If you look in stripper straw, you will still see in between the rows, it's dry. And I believe that dry is our low humidity in our air that pulls that water up back up out of the out of the soil. So I feel like this is an opinion. It's not based on science. I mean, it could be, but I don't know the science that putting that down, covering that ground is almost more effective in this area, even with our winds. It, I believe it keeps that wind just high enough off of there that it doesn't dry it out near as fast. Um, it allows those microbes to aggregate that soil better. And uh, it also keeps the water from moving across that soil. We get much, much better infiltration. So covering the soil, I believe is extremely important. Here's kind of the way we used to do it, is just planting corn into wheat straw. You can see we've got good soil coverage in between those rows. This is one of the hardest things. We get a really, this wasn't probably, I don't remember which year it was, wasn't this year. But we, I believe that that corn plant creates a humidity, which causes the breakdown of that straw much, much faster than if you were 
to plan nothing at all in that wheat straw. <laughs> we can see wheat straw last all the way through the summer and not with almost no breakdown. We put a corn crop out there, and I have seen, unless it's good 100 bushel wheat straw that you're planting into, you know, if it's just 30, 40 bushel wheat straw, you'll have bare soil at the end of that corn growing season when you harvest. So getting cover crops, getting different types of residue out there, Wheat is straw is one of the best, but it's may not be the best for our biology. But it is one of the best as far as long term uh, hanging out there. But I guess what I wanted to show is we want to keep that soil covered even between the rows. Um, here's another thing we tried, uh, which is rolling down. This is actually a, a roller that I borrowed from uh, Jay, and um, I don't know. I have varying opinions on it but if you can get that mat down and get it on the soil it's great this was rye it was a little thin and um you need to grow a good crop to get good soil coverage thin crops don't go down very easy one of the things we did learn um here's a different year we used oats good crop of oats laid down beautifully and made a really nice thatch where it wasn't so thick and we had weeds the oats laid down really nice. The weeds did not. <laughs> okay, so a roller does not terminate weeds for those who are hoping it did. Um, at least not around here. At least not kosher. At, at that, that was done, I think, in June. So, uh, But here is planting wheat. I believe we planted wheat into that rolled stuff and then harvested it the next year. This was done, I think this was done back in 11 or 12, so this was prior to getting lots of biology out there in the soil. So this was kind of in a beginning stage, and it worked really good. We had a really nice wheat crop. We had, you know, no, no chemicals were needed to suppress weeds or anything, and we still had some residue left at the end of that year. So I believe it's still, it's even important out in our pastures to, uh, to get those grasses kind of munched down and even more importantly pushed back down to create that thatch layer to get longer successions. We're, we're a short grass prairie in this area and short grass prairie is kind of a not a deep root system and it's a really kind of a tight thatch and um, we want to move that successional to a little taller grass where we can get a little more tonnage. Um, we still want to keep that quality um, where I've noticed some of the taller grasses like this are not a high quality thing come next spring. But uh, we have, by, by mashing this stuff down, we've actually seen some C4 grasses like Big Blue and some other things start to come in our grass pastures. Um, and I had never seen those before. So the wheat bank gets there somehow. I don't know how, or not wheat. Seed bank for grasses is there somehow, somewhere. And it does seem to appear over time. Um, but having high stock density, mashing that stuff down, and then leaving it for a whole 12 months till the next grazing season does change our pasture. I've seen the, the fastest growth and the fastest change in our pastures with rotational grazing much faster than we seem to be able to move it out there on our crop fields. Um, so I just I threw that in. I, I don't know how many cattle people are in here, but... Uh, Getting that thatch back down on the ground, even out in our pastures, is important. All right, next principle, minimizing soil disturbance. Like I said, I don't have a lot of slides on this, but basically it comes down to not tilling. Here's a no-till crop put into wheat stripper straw. Um, you know, soil disturbance is not just tillage. It's also some of the chemicals we put out there. There are several chemicals we use that will almost negate the fungal growth of our in our plants, in our soils. Um, protozoa is another thing. I've really, really struggled to get the, I've put the protozoa out there. We'll come back three or four months later and we won't be able to find it in our soil. Um, so <clears throat> I've been told that some of these chemicals really do suppress it. Um, nitrogen's another thing. It needs nitrogen, but um, I don't know. I haven't figured out. We're starting to get them in certain areas. So, uh, but chemicals are also a, what we would call disturbance. Um, they're necessary. You know, you, you've got to control those weeds and stuff. 
but we need to eliminate that long fallow period, okay? I, I believe, which I'll, I'll, I guess we'll touch on later, but minimal disturbance, disturbance is both, and in cattle are a third way to, or livestock are a third way to disturb that soil. They will tear that soil up, especially you'll notice around your water tanks, but if they're left in an area too long, they'll put that thatch down and you leave them there much longer, they'll destroy that thatch and start messing up your soil too. So cattle can be used for disturbance. So we don't, we don't want to leave them in one place too long. And diversity, like I said, this is one of my favorite things, especially for slides. It's, it's a lot of fun to show diversity. Um, here's a brassica mixed in with some uh, cool season stuff. Um, here we had, oh, probably wheat. Actually, I think that's rye. Wheat, oats, barley. That's kind of what we use for our cool season mix. This, I think, is just straight wheat. Next to uh, another trial, which I think that might have been canola. I don't remember. Um, but we want to we get different roots in there. The canola we have found is awesome. You never have any... Uh, Nemo, it seems to really affect our soil pests, you know, behind these brassicas, both the radishes and the canola and some of these others, really, I think, eliminate the need for fungicides on your seed. I, we just don't, we just don't see those issues. And nematodes, we don't see the, when we pull up samples and look through it through a microscope, we don't see the root feeding nematodes. Um, and we've we've had these brassicas across about all our acres now, and I've it's been a long time since I've seen a root feeder. Not that they aren't out there, but we just don't see them in high enough numbers that my little sample shows them. Um, like I said, not that they're not out there. Here's a clover that came in naturally. It came into one of our plyas um, after grazing and and in a dry period, and then that plya filled up, and then the water went away and we had this clover come in. Um, this is on a field that's been farmed for, I don't know, probably 30 years, and I've never seen clover. I didn't know clover would grow in this country. It's a natural, I think it's clover, maybe it's a weed that I don't know about, but it, to me it looked like clover. And it came in and um, has a really large seed, so I don't know if it's a uh, legume. Um, I didn't see any nodulation on the roots, but uh, you know, we didn't call it bad, so. <laughs> we left it out there. Um, here's another one of our mixes, you know, for diversity. You can tell cattle prefer the, the actual crop that we plant versus the weeds. Um, so we do graze weeds, but it's not necessarily what you want out there. I'll just, I'll be straight up with you. Um, but, and the cattle seem to select when those weeds are no longer the most palatable thing out there. They will select for what is most palatable, which this is a BMR grazing corn, sunflower. I think there was some sun amp. There's, there's several things in there, and you can tell they selected all those over the weeds. Um, this is some diversity in the actual growing crop. Uh, this is about as big as I've gotten on, when we planted in with like corn or milo. I think this might have been in a milo crop, but this was in between the rows. But we did get some clover. Um, clover, everybody tells you to put clover out there. I've had limited success. I'll be straight up. I've had limited success getting clover to grow in this country. And I blame it on the humidity, but I don't know if that's true. Um, but it just seems like it's hard. Um, here's, here's another picture of diversity. I like the flowers. We get lots of uh, insects coming off of these fields. You will see insects. I've seen even honeybees out here in these fields. I don't know where they come from because I don't think there's any hives within miles and miles of us, but we've seen these. Uh, they, they also put a nice aroma in the field around your house, so we like to plant these kind of mixes close by. Here's another mix where we put the mill. This is our warm season mix. We've got millet. We've got sorghum sedans. Um, sun hemp should be in there for our legume. There should be a cow pea you see down here low. There's a cow pea growing in there. So we want to get our main crops, but we want all these crops that share between each other out there. So we've got legumes for our nitrogen. We've got, uh, uh, there should be a brassica in there. It may not be in 
that large in the summertime. We usually have a brass skin there. You know, our grasses are are the millet and the sorghum sedan. These are different heights. Um, this is earlier in the season, but later in the season, that sorghum sedan went ahead and outgrew the rest of this. Although that pearl millet is a very large plant, so it, it stays right there. And the sun hemp is the reason we plant it for a legume. It'll grow however tall the residue around it grows. So it'll grow up to six, eight feet also. Um, so when you're putting them together and mix, we want the grass, we want the lagoon, we want the uh, brassica, and then we want a broadleaf of some sort in there. And that's kind of what our mix is. So we have those four uh, groups in there. And um, then we just play with the ratios and the plants. Here's another cash crop that we put out there that we don't put out every year. We put it out probably once every four or to six to seven years. It's, it's not common. Um, but some years the market is way better on this than any other crop we can put out there. This was a good year, obviously. Um, it's me standing in this sunflower field. Those leaves on those plants, I bet, were I don't know, two or three times larger than my hand. I mean, it's, it was a phenomenal crop. And this is on dry land with no added moisture. So um, they are scavenging, they'll go deep and they will get all those nutrients that the cover crops, the wheat, the corn didn't get, and the moisture too. So once these things get going, they are a good scavenger. Um, I've heard a lot of complaints about what comes after them, um, but usually you can go in there with a shallow grass crop, um, providing it rains in the spring or the, through the winter, you catch some snow. <coughs> You'll be all right, and that I don't. We don't. We don't have a lot of trouble behind. Them. Here's another mix. I just wanted to show you. We've even put pumpkins out there. Cattle love pumpkins. Gives them a variety. You know, they like a little variety in their in their food too. Um, and I love pumpkins. You know, if if you'll notice in our natural environment, we see gourds. Um, we call them gourds. They're little. Like produce a little fruit about yay big, big old leaves, deep tap root and lots and lots of vining. And we'll see them and they survive. I mean, they grew this year just fine. Um, bindweed's another one that grew this year just fine. So we prefer, <laughs> we prefer to have something that we like out there and that the cattle like. And so we, you know, green cover suggested they had excess. They had a, a pumpkin seed that they had gotten somewhere and, and they've had squash that they've gotten, squash and zucchini that that somebody messed up and so they got a batch of that or they'll get watermelons. Uh, watermelons didn't grow for me, but these gourds, pumpkins, squash, they do awesome. Um, planted after, you know, it, <laughs> these are all planted after a wheat crop um, and they do awesome in this country. So don't, don't be afraid to try. Uh, I mean, you don't want to go out and buy it from a actual garden seed company because you won't be able to afford to put it out there. But where you get random deals don't be afraid to put out seed that's somebody else considers a waste you know go ahead and take that one year we went to the i don't know i had the co-op guy say well i've got all these sample seed bags of corn that i'm gonna have to take to the dump and because our local ethanol plant quit taking it i have to take it to the dump or we have to get rid of somehow you want it and i was like sure i mean it was all treated but we threw it in with cover crop mix and it grazed just fine came up uh, probably only a third of that corn actually came up and grew because most of it wasn't designed for dry land. But it was free seed, and it, you know, it grew. So that is part of keeping that root in the soil, you know, without paying too much, you know. We've got to keep it economical. We've got to realize where our budget is and how this is going to fit into it. And we've got to stay within those parameters because we have to survive or, you know, next year won't happen. And it takes years to build the system we are after. Like I said, this is the concept that I struggle oh, this It's not up there. I don't know how to adjust it, but it's maintain a continuous living plant root all the time. Without a perennial out there, we struggle with that. If we're gonna put wheat into our system, we have never had a good wheat crop where we grow a cover crop into August. Um, where we put spring cover crops in, 
and then allow July and August to set, we can have really good wheat crops off of that. We have had a couple really good wheat crops off of that. So, so yeah, that system seems to kind of work in this arid environment, but because it gives you that, he doesn't he doesn't run cattle out there, and that is something I'm going to have to play with is not having cattle to harvest some of these cover crops because that cover of the soil is key, and that spring cover crop that we put out there, if we take cattle across it, it is it's gone by the time we get through August. It just I don't know where it goes, but it, it doesn't stay. Um, it breaks down, goes into the soil is what I'm hoping the microbes take it. Um, or it's, I have a feeling quite a bit of it's oxidizing off. But it's, it's because we get that nitrogen put out there from the dung and urine of the cattle and also the trampling and the, the disturbance. And that really makes that residue break down and go away fast. But that fallow period allowing that rain to accumulate. We have deep soils out here that will go much deeper than six feet, but they go at least six feet that will hold water. And our plants can go down six feet and grab that water if there's not a compaction layer in there. So to make that to multiply or to hold that, you know, <clears throat> that I don't I don't know what that calculates into, but it is way more rain than we get in a year. We have the ability to hold a year's worth of rain, is what I'm saying, in our soil. So to give a month or two to accumulate a little bit and then plant that crop has always won. I, I, I hate to say it, but we, we can't beat a small fallow period in there. We don't want a 12 or 14 or 16 month fallow period, but a, two, a one, two or three sure benefits over planting directly into a terminated cover crop or a, you know, with wheat. With corn, you know, it's a spring thing, so to ha you can you can grow it all year long and you'll have your fallow period through that winter. Works great for corn. The more residue you have out there for corn, the better it'll respond. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of my opinion on it, but the soil health principle is maintaining living root in the soil at all times. So but always keep in mind your context where you're at and your environment. Integrating livestock. This is probably the principle I enjoy the most is the livestock, although sometimes I would like a break but <clears throat> and not have them out there and have to take care of them. But we do love cattle. This is a picture of, I think we were uh, strip grazing. So what we did is we cut down the, uh, the cover crop kind of like we would a feed crop. Instead of baling it, we just left it. We raked two or three windrows together and um then when the snow comes why we would we would move our fence across that and it didn't matter we usually don't get over every now and then we will get an exceptional event but most of the time we don't get over a foot of snow we don't have to do anything but move the fence i mean it doesn't it doesn't affect us as far as feed or whatever you know the cattle strip grazing is probably the most efficient way we have done it and we've done bale grazing we've done running them out across that uh, cover crop in the, in the winter time. You get much better coverage and trampling, but as far as feed for the cattle to make it through the winter, strip gazing is even more efficient, I think, than bailing it up and hauling it to them. And definitely takes a lot less energy and uh, time. Here's our cattle out on a... Uh, fall cover crop on a foggy day. I think it's foggy that or my camera was blurry, but um, <clears throat> we use a steel rod for the end and you know, three quarter inch posts. And then we use poly wire for the rest of the strip and we can do that up to a mile long. So it, it's really easy to set up and take down these fences. Um, here's an example of running across that uh, a uh, summer cover, cover crop. Um, and getting it, trying to get it trampled down. You can see here's a pigweed or two that was out there. Um, in a good cover crop establishment, those weeds, they're, they are there, but they don't, uh, I mean, they're cattle food. They, they strip all the leaves off of there. They don't like those prickly stuff, but they, they will take all the leaves off of there. Um, uh, John, so for on that summer, can you put back that summer mix? What are you planting that? I'm guessing this one was probably a field that didn't, have 
I'm guessing it was probably planted in May. Okay. So did you did you do a pre-emergent out there and then plant your cover crop, or are you just spraying up? No. What, if we were doing that, we would probably come in. If there's cool season weeds, like cheat or something like that, we'd go in with a probably a Roundup or something to, to cool up, to clean up any grasses. Um, we don't have a lot of cool season problems. Um, we may, because we're trying to transition back from a warm season corn and milo rotation to a wheat. Um, for that problem, we, we've got kochia and, and pigweeds that are kind of there, and we'd like to not have to take care of them all with chemicals, go back to a, uh, and to do that, we need to go to a cool season because we get, we get suppression from those, gra from those cool season grasses. Um, but I'm sure this one was planted probably middle of May, I would guess. Um, but you are new to something ahead of time. Yeah, so on that one, we would probably have come in <clears throat> probably the first of May or before we planted. Or, you know, we usually we don't spray more than one week ahead of, of when we're planting that time of year. So, because you're early enough in the season, we don't get a lot of growth. About the only thing we'd be worried about would be a mustard or a. That's probably about it that time of year, unless we have a problem with cheat, which we've tried to eliminate, but doesn't mean it stays gone. Um, here's where we've gone in behind stocks, planted a cool season in there, and this is probably, we're grazing, I would say this is probably the end of April, somewhere in April. So um, <clears throat> this is getting our livestock out on our land. We've kind of gotten to where we have livestock run across every acre of our farm at least once a year. Some acres get them multiple times, but we try to get them across our land at least once a year at some way, in some way. Cool season, does that mean planted in the fall? No, that means it probably planted the 1st of March. Okay. Into February, 1st of March. Sorry for the stocks, I've nothing done until February at work. Yeah, yeah. All right, here we're moving across uh, a warm season cover crop. Um, what I wanted to show in this picture was uh, one of the tools we do use for moving our cattle and getting them out there on the land is a bat latch. <clears throat> this allows us to go through and set up our our paddocks, you know, two or three days. We're probably moving at least once a day, if not twice a day, on, on something like this. Um, but we can go ahead and set them up for three or four days at a time. And I can set my – a lot of times I'll set all my paddocks up for a week, and then I'll just leave the gate openings, and all i got to do is move that gate with the cattle. So these will automatically open at say seven o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning when I set them. Cattle are all moved. I go out there, pick that gate up, move it or close it. Close one, move the other one to the other side and we're ready for the next one. It takes about 30 minutes to check cattle and move them. Can you explain how do you provide water for that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's, it's not easy it, and it changes every year I have a different idea um, and it is one of the obstacles that we do have to overcome um, I will I'll say it but yeah we'll talk about it here in a sec um, in these large things we have learned that you don't just go put a fence across there um, the cattle kind of need to know where that break is before they get to the fence so we've we we threw a GPS on our skid steer and put a little six foot mower on there to mow our fence lines and we'll go in and mow, I don't know, two or three weeks ahead of fence lines in those paddocks across there, uh, across that field. And then that way, whoever's setting that fence up doesn't have to figure out how to drive straight. Because you can't, can't see anything going through those fields. And our, our, the first time we tried it without mowing these, our lines were not straight. I mean, they were all over the place. So a phone GPS is nowhere near straight enough to put a fence up with. So we, we learned, so we started mowing it. We, we bought a little six foot mower that goes on a skid steer, put an old GPS that we had had laying around because we pulled it out of the tractor and updated and it works great. We put our A and B point and can measure them out and, and we'll go in and, and do that for our setup. Here's what uh, we had a local welding shop build for us, made some manufacturing over there, Leota build it for us. Um, we just use a drill and uh, I can roll up a mile of fence on this. This will, one of these rolls will hold a mile and a half of poly wire and we can roll it, you know, a mile. We've got one field that's a mile wide. Well, we've got more than one, but went up to a mile 
run, you know, is about as far as I want to put poly wire. And we can roll that up probably in about, I don't know, six, eight minutes. So, um, and we just use the drills, the power. I don't know, probably better ways to do it, but this is what we do and this it works really good. We can we can throw these uh things out. Here's kind of one idea we built for we went and got these spools from Western Valley Sprinkler. Um they had used them for their pipe or wire, I don't know, but they had a bunch of them sitting out there one day and asked if I could what they wanted for them and they just gave them to me. So we we built an A-frame to build it on. We put a pipe through the middle and we just used cam locks on the end to hook them up to our hydrants. And this will go out, I have a half mile pipe on there basically. Um, and that'll get us mostly from the edge of our field out to about the middle of our field. And so we will run paddocks usually one to two to three days away from the water and then we move our water point. Um, water is, I would like to have a better method than having to move my water tank. I'd like something that's a lot more mobile. Uh, I've seen a lot of ideas. I haven't actually figured out which one I'm going to do when we upgrade. So right now we've got, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but we just use a poly tank that's about eight foot wide, holds about, I don't know, six, eight hundred. So we just, <clears throat> I usually have two of them in the summertime, two to three, so as to have enough supply out there so our water will keep up with them. Um, and um, we just empty those, move them to the next spot, and them back up you want to move your tanks you want to let your cattle go through the gate and move your tanks the same day don't give them any time because by the time those water tanks get full the cattle will start that will be full and they'll come over to start drinking and if they start drinking and get behind on water once one cow they must talk because once one cow decides there's not enough water there they tell everybody and the whole herd comes over and it's it's a mess in the summertime <laughs> so water is extremely important feature that you got to plan for um, if you're going to have cattle all on your crop ground you need to have a water system figured out and running them half a mile to water in the summertime is uh, is not a real beneficial day if you're working on gains if you're using stalkers or anything besides cows here's some of the other livestock that we've accumulated that shows up on our land it took oh it probably took three or four or five years after we quit all the porons and Ivmex for these things to show up, but now, you know, we see these every year. We even saw them this year in a drive. They love after a rain, you can go out and check and these things, these populations within two or three days after, a, it has to be a, a decent rain, half inch or more. But after a good rain, these things, they explode. They're there for about two or three weeks and they decline. Um, they don't necessarily go away. You'll still find them here and there, but it seems they really have an ebb and flow in our country. I wish... Wish we didn't have that ebb and flow, but I don't know what to do about it. Because they need to be out there working all the time. I mean, my cattle are pooping all the time. I need bugs out there distributing and burying it all the time. But these are the free workers that come and come and work for you once you start to get, get a system that is conducive to them, you know, that doesn't kill them when they bore into that paddock. Um, Ivamectum, I've told, is probably one of the longest and most deadliest products on these uh, manure distributing insects. And there's a lot. These are the fun ones to watch because they make a little ball and they, they work together, you know, and moving all around. But there's, there's a lot more than these guys in those paddocks. So there's, there's a little guy that bores straight down. There's, I don't know, there's a whole lot. There's a little fly. I didn't put the picture in here, but there's a little fly we see out there that's, that's tearing that patty apart and making all these holes and stuff. But it's just really neat to see these things distributed and go back down into the soil. In fact, when you go out there, <clears throat> oh, probably a month after those cattle are gone, out on our crop fields, you won't hardly find any, any manure of any sorts. One day when I was building one of those paddocks and gates, I realized, I looked down and realized I was standing right in the middle of a, a bee home. We had these little bees. I don't know where they come from. I hadn't seen them before. I asked. They said they're quite common, but they were out there kind of in one of those cover crops that had quite a few flowers. They make all these little burrows, which all these little burrows are great places for water to flow into. But, um, and they just look like a little honeybee. But anyways, I just thought that was really neat. We had these things out there. This is some more of the diversity of livestock, I guess you'd call it. And then these guys, um, what, 
what made me take a picture of these things these is kind of a grass spider out there they're pretty big you know they get about yay big but it was a whole pile of grasshopper parts laying underneath that that i really thought man these guys have a place out here because grasshoppers have really exploded with these drier weather you know and um this is free workers out there cleaning those things up for us um there wasn't near enough because we still had grasshoppers that were bugging me but <clears throat> They are at least working. And then these guys are the underground livestock that we are trying to build out. And we do now when we go out and dig our wheat up or dig our mile or whatever, just about always dig up little tiny worms that are somewhere in that furrow or whatever, <clears throat> as long as there's enough moisture to make the crop grow. If there's not enough moisture to make the crop grow, these guys probably aren't there either. So I guess in conclusion, life is better when we start working with nature. Here's the cowbirds are, have come in. We have a herd that stays with our cattle at all times now. Used to leave in the wintertime. Seems like they're still, they, they go quite a ways in the winter. They aren't there when the, the winds get cold and stuff. But uh, the cattle seem quite happy to have them around. Um, it does, it, when you see everything kind of in harmony, it makes you feel like maybe maybe we're going down the right path. So. Is there any questions? <laughs> yeah. Preaching the, using Ivermec, um, we, we use Ivermec only for treating lice, but it's detrimental apparently to the, the good um, insects that are going to be out there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so he asked about Ivermectin, um, and it is very effective for lice. It's, very, it's, a, it's an extremely effective uh, pesticide for internal insects and stuff um but i've been told that it can last in those cow patties in the soil for up to five years um so it, it it's very detrimental also to quite a few insects there's some that are coming out that they say are good for dung beetles but not all of them it still kills quite a quite a range of dung beetles it doesn't get the great big ones um but it'll kill a lot of the little ones i mean if you look at your cow patties when you start to get your soils healthy you will see that there's a whole gamut of insects in there some are flies um, and i would guess they're in any of those insecticides that don't kill those little flies in the fly larvas. and they're not they're not the kind of flies that are biting the insects so they're a they're a little yellow fly that's actually i think eating the fly larvas in the cow patty so and i have no idea where they where they reproduce at but um yeah i i don't know that ivermectin th there are some other products out there i think that'll do the same thing that are closer i mean we've eliminated them all together but that are closer to uh helpful real, real quick neil hold on one second so we switched to cydectin and we saw our first dung beetle last year i was heartbroken because i ran over it and killed it <laughs> uh, but this year i, I saw there's seven different times i saw um the green looking um dung beetle but i am i've been told that even um cydectin make sterilizes them so even though they're living i don't know that they're able to reproduce so i'm doing more research about that i really encourage you guys to the thing i kind of realized was is like the only effect it has on my cows is they're hairless for part of the season and then it grows back from the summer so if i can get it down to where i'm only you know treating the yearlings with cydectin i think i'm gonna make a huge jump if I just stop treating the cows, because I'm not hardly ever selling my cows, so what's the negative effect of not even treating my cows? Because then I think that that'll really help the, the population as well. Something else I want to add to that. <clears throat> Genetics help a lot with that problem in the wintertime. Um, it, it, <clears throat> the reason it's worse on stocks is, is the sun, the length of the sun that they're exposed to. As that Sundays get longer, why that problem goes away naturally. But something that we have added is, um, iodine and sulfur we put that in our salt so we, we have a free range salt that's out there at all times and we have a product that we it's called well it used to be sister salt i think it's called buddy salt now because different person making it but um it's very high in the iodine and sulfur and and that sulfur will take care of most all your internal will, will really help with your internal pest problems and it seems to get rid of it helps with the flies in the summertime too so um 
<clears throat> nutrition will help a lot with those insect problems and won't eliminate them, but it will help. And then also genetics. Genetics help quite a bit too. So, or you had some of you. Pumpkins are natural. I've heard that too. So that is one reason we started growing them. Go <laughs> off of all your neighbors in town. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's work I don't have time for. But yeah, Ed, we go pick up pick up one to pick up pick pumpkins after Halloween. Well, if anybody wanted to bring them to me, I'd be more than happy to take them with you. Such cheap. Yeah, there are sterile varieties. We tend to tend to go with that in our BMR varieties. About everything's always BMR. Um, I haven't gone back to the older varieties. Uh, I've thought about it, but uh, you know, a lot of times we're in there and harvesting before that stuff makes us deceit. And, and a lot of it, a lot of our stuff doesn't go until after the wheat is harvested. And most of that stuff doesn't ever get a chance to. I, no, it really it hasn't been a problem. I could see it being a problem if you have Johnson grass. Now, it'll show up. <clears throat> if it comes in with your seed, it'll show up in your Milo. Um, but that's about the only one I've seen show up in Milo. We've gotten to where we do our rotation, so we'll have a summer mix, and then next year it gets corn. I will not put corn or Milo where I had sorted Sudan grasses. Um, it, you know, millets, I'm not quite as worried. Millets I have gotten volunteer on, and it can produce your Milo, actually. So there you yeah. go. Can you say that louder? I'm sorry. Uh, like conventional corn seed or like open pollinated to try to breed your own corn behind like cover crops and like weed control or and try to hurt anybody. Because I've heard that like doing some of this, you know, you're you kind of got one shot to keep it in minus, you know, like one herbicide, one corn sprout. So on our irrigated ground, we did one year of Jimmy Red. Um, it yielded in the test strip that we did, I think, 80 bushels an acre, and the corn did over 200. And a lot of that was the cutworm issue that we're hoping to fix this year. So we're going to go back with some test strips of Jimmy Red. Um, I had a, a dry land field that we were going to do a full 40 acres of Jimmy Red and interseed cover crops and just see what that 40 acres did. If that way, if, if it was overrun with weeds, I just run cattle in there and and then start over with the Jimmy Red deal or go in there and pick the ears of Jimmy Red that I liked, you know, to for my own breeding purposes. We may move our sprinkler and that cut my area of my test strip back, so I don't know. We're kind of in a limbo, but I'm definitely going to do test strips because, that, like I said, like you want to get away from the GMO uh, corn just because, like, as you're affecting that GMO of, of the plant, there's, there's all kinds of consequences. Maybe Glenn can answer some of those questions, but... There's a lot of consequences that we don't even realize from growing jeep and for it. Now, you have trouble with your water getting feet off and you run up a three half mile by plant. So I've I've asked um, Jim Garish has done a lot of this and I asked him in that question because it feels almost too hot to the touch coming out the end of that black pipe when it's laying on top of the ground uh, in the summertime. And um, he claims that up they they saw no reduction in consumption or yield or uh, gain loss on cattle they were drinking and they they were that water was running around 100 degrees they said because they said in reality you don't want that water cold it'll actually restrict the amount of water they drink because a cow <clears throat> don't don't quote me on this because I'm I'm taking this from memory but that when a cow if you'll notice a cow when they come up to a cold water tank they will take a drink and then they'll step away while that warms up. And it's kind of the way it was described to me. While that warms up and then they'll come and take another drink. And if that stuff is warm, they'll sit there and drink it until they're full. So it, it doesn't seem to be detrimental. Now, if it's running like 180 degrees, I think, yeah, that's, that's too hot. But we're usually around that 100 degrees uh, in the summertime. The longer your stretch is, the hotter it's going to get. But... Um, yeah, I've done the same thing you have with the black pipe. I took it to a hydrant and I pushed it a mile in my field, and the water to be about about at 30 degrees. It we had a lot of 100 degree gain to hop in. I noticed that 
when the cows and calves will come up and lick at the water like you do when the water isn't very good. They'll kind of test, test it, and they'll pick a little tree, and they'll move around close to the water tank. They'll come back. I see them coming to the water a lot more, but to, I even do men and grazing, so you know, I move my water tank just like you do. So as long as you keep them in that 0.75 to 1 acre patch, depending on your number, they'll just constantly, the constant stream yeah. that program. And you use big tanks. I use a protein tub, and I just put it in the corner of my poly reel. The only two of them heck at a time, but I have a constant flow all yeah. the time. And my um, return rate of my water, I feel like it's faster than it would a big tank, so I don't, don't notice the problems of them pounding on it as much. Do they come get a drink and leave? I just put a truck tire in there. Around <clears throat> to Wilbur, I have to with Paul. I wondered on when you got 300, 250 head, 300 head, I just. <clears throat> if you're not there monitoring it, there's so many things that can go wrong with that water. Uh, that's why I want that supply. I want I want an hour or two. Yeah, worth a supply or or for if something goes wrong, I want to be able to. Yeah, because with two or three tanks, I can I can go out there with a uh, with a truckload of water and fill all three of those things up, and we we can catch back up. So we we have an emergency supply set in, over here because I have. Inevitably, a cow will somehow break something. It just uh, seems. Neil, like... do you use your question about water? <clears throat> okay, hold on, hold up, because I want to uh, grab up real quick with water. Uh, ben, do you want to tell them about your water system real quick? And then Kevin, you want to tell them about your water system? Yeah, we we uh we bit the bullet and did all permanent period. Uh, even in our farm ground, we split fields in half, generally speaking, and uh, we put risers every so far. We fall about inside of an eight inch pipe. Yeah, and we can just as we move along down the field, we just switch to a different riser. We start out to about three hundred feet apart. That's a little overkill. And six to eight hundred feet seems to work pretty good. And then your rotations are a summer cover crop, or do you get spring in that too? Oh, we do mostly summer stuff. We struggle with the spring one. Same here. So you do summer cover crop, and then followed by milo or corn. Yeah, we'd like to get back to wheat if we can. Yeah, um, but otherwise, yeah, we go back to milo or corn. Awesome. Kevin? Yeah, um, sounds similar to Ben's there. We, we've uh, installed lots and lots of permanent water lines, two inch bottom. Well, we have several tire tanks, permanent tanks. I don't know if I do that again, but uh, and then we have lots of risers just with cloths and valves as well, so we can water all of our crop land and the uh, freight land now. Where we can so I have a question for you. What do you use for the supply line going under the ground? Is that a two inch also? Yeah, we started using it at a PVC because we could get it bought really cheap. Uh, we've moved on to the HDP now because the price isn't that much different. HDP is a far superior. Yes, it product. is. That's something else I would say on this is it needs to be an HDP pipe, especially if you're using it in cold weather because that will expand and. Don't short yourself on the water. All right. You're going to do it. We do 50 gallon a minute pumps. <laughs> I think our longest run's about four miles, and we still get 25 gallon a minute at the end. How far is your longest run, Kevin? Um, the, well, we got two wells on. Tomorrow. They don't fight against each other, so we have a valve, so right. one gets the alley. It'll be a group stuff. South and north, well, up and north, maybe. Three miles, okay. Do you guys mind sharing what your system costs, or do you, you know what should? Oh, man, that's changed so much yeah. in yeah. the last couple of years. Um, all when we first started doing it, we started on the crop ground actually before we did our pastures. But when we first started, that had been about 2016, 17, somewhere in there. We were doing it all the fence and water and the whole golf field for about $90 an acre. Right. But it, you feel like it's a work, oh, the change is worth it? Well, it just gives us so many more options. Yeah. We got, we got a lot more flexibility. Yeah. It's not all rainbows and unicorns. It's got some <laughs> sure. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Why do you do my cross knee and how often do you do it? So I do it on our extracts anytime we're putting it. And I also do it to monitor our compost. And on the, the field soil, I don't know, whenever I feel like it or I, I got an issue that I want to see if there's a difference in the in the biology. So, you know, it's not my favorite thing to do. I mean, it is once I get started, but gathering it and then going and sitting down in the office and looking at that thing for several hours is not my favorite thing to do. Um, but I, every time we make an extract, I pull a sample out of it 
because <clears throat> I want to know what we're pulling out of our compost and what we're putting out there. Um, you know, when I told Jay what we were doing, applying to our uh, seed, we've actually pulled that back to now we're only one, one pound or one gallon of extract to 100 bushels of, of seed. No, 32, 300. Be 10. So one gallon to every 10 bushels of seed is kind of is kind of where we're at now. Um, so that would be less than what you were doing, right? 70 to 500. Yeah. I was told there'd be no math, so. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, so we've actually backed that up and it's because our compost is now a much higher quality compost than it was five, six years ago, or even two or three years ago. Um, we're getting much, much higher fungal strands in there. I mean, when I first started, fungal was almost, I mean, it was really hard to get going. Um, partly because I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> and I didn't have a, a network to pull from. But now that we got those fungal numbers up there, why we've started cutting back the total number of pounds that we use and also the num the amount of, and I just, so my system is pretty simple. We, I don't extract it through a big extractor. I just take what they, they, they sell a little tea bag that's, I don't know, about yay wide and yay deep. And it's, it's a really pretty fine mesh. And so I'll put in about, you know, I, I got a 30 gallon barrel that I just cut the top out of and we just take and we put about 15 pounds in there and, and dump it in that 30, 30 gallon barrel, mix it around, slosh it around for, I don't know, five, 10, 15 minutes, however long I feel. And then uh, I'll let it set in there and then I pull it out. And uh, then we just spray that on our wheat as it goes up the auger into the drill. So um, wheat, grain, corn, we've done it all. And it works good. Yeah, but anybody else that's best grazing cover crops, sorry. Are you having issues with compaction? And if you are, how, how you deal with that? That's been off. Yes. That's that's why that ability to move is so important because any place they stand, stomp, or around the water tank, I mean, that water tank is really a sacrifice area. It doesn't make up a third of an acre, probably even a quarter of an acre, but it is kind of a sacrifice. It's going to all fill in with weeds because it's too tight a soil for any of your later successional plants to grow. Um, or go in there and rip it, or go in there and, and, and some, somehow get it fluffed back. But the, even in that area where they've sat there and they've pounded and pounded on it, like, like in the winter time, this year won't be a problem. We won't have any compaction because we're dry. So you, you won't even notice where those water tanks, even though we've been there for a month because we walk away from the water tank in the winter time, um, so we'll sit in the same water place for, for quite some time on the bigger fields. But um, if there's any moisture event while your cattle are there, there's a compaction event that takes place. Uh, it's not deep. Um, iron will make it go away almost immediately. Um, otherwise, those plants will make it go away. Sometimes it takes two or three years. So you're adding iron in furrow when you're... No, iron by, I mean, going there and rip it up. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> rip it up where that, I mean, because, you know, we're, we're on small paddocks. Therefore, you know, it's not two, it's only two or three, maybe five acres. Maybe ten. It's not a huge area that got messed. We don't move them during the rain or after the rain unless we move them off of the crop field onto the grass. If you'll notice your pastures, even with an inch, two inch rain, they, they'll still hold those cattle up. So that's where we'd like to get our crop fields, but we're a long ways from getting to that ability to support that, especially larger animals. Stalkers, we don't have too much trouble at all. But the most angry I was at myself is we did, we got in, when I was in, I guess I wasn't in quick run, but I did three years in a row of cover crops and just grazing them, trying to build up the health on that ground. And then we came back with Milo, and then we brought stalkers in and had steers on it, and then December 15th, 2021, the day that will live in infamy forever, that huge event with 100 mile an hour winds just stripped most of the topsoil off, off that field. And that was just from, we had like 120 steers out there for less than, you know, a month. And so I, from that point on, I was like, I, in a dry year, I am not going to put, you know, calves on a field like that and now that i say that i'm like okay I, i'm doing that right now and i gotta get them moved pretty quick but like you know you you just run the risk of your, your ground broke blowing um we did 50 
bred heifers on 80 acres of corn and we were rotating them every day. They only lasted 20, 20 days on our on our dry land corn. And I told dad, I'm, I'm worried about this. And we had that big wind event last week and that ground did not blow. So if you keep them moving, then you're gonna save your ground. If you have them on a big area and you have them out there multiple months, your ground is gonna blow in a 50 mile an hour wind event. You won't be able to stop it. So did it suck going out there every morning in November, moving those bread efforts every single day? Yes, it did. But like, if you have a large group of them, like we're, we're going to rent some, you know, dry land ground and we have our own, we'll put, you know, 160 cows on a quarter and they're only going to be there two weeks. We'll get them on that quarter and we'll get them off. And so the more moves you can do, the more it brings more work to it. But the, like, you have to think of it, it's a more work up front, but it's a long-term investment into your ground in what you're doing like if i could go back and save my soil that i lost because i had too many stalkers on that milo i'd, I'd do it in a heartbeat so kevin did you have anything you wanted to add to that as far as like rotations and stuff no i i mean there's just times like where it's just wet for two or three weeks you know that we will get them off we go back to maybe but there's times where if it's wet like that i think they're better off being spread out than just confined in a small area yeah, we have found that if you open that great big up, you don't have the noticeable. It's still there. Every step they take will still take the same amount of compaction. But, you know, the animals are so far apart that, you know, the plants will will pretty well cover that. So, yeah, you either get them off, get them spread out, or just come in and fix that area after they're gone. I mean, you, those are kind of your three options. But it will happen, yeah. And the longer One, you're doing it, the less the less of effect it has. When you yeah. when you first start and you're just building your soil off back up, your compaction will be way greater than it is when you build up to aggregates and you get rain. And when you get this soil covered and you have that thick mat out there over the top, why it it will that compaction that even with that rain event, that compaction is a lot less as long as you don't stay in one place too long. Um, but getting that built up and then getting that aggregation and then getting that root structure under there which holds all that soil together basically uh, doing what nature does out on the prairie you have to build that and that takes time and every time we go out there and till it up you know we're breaking that all back down to however deep we we tilled that <laughs>